Thank you, Victor. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, this has been such a, an amazing experience from so many different perspectives, uh, especially staying at the Royal Hawaiian. Be <laughs> I actually stayed there 30 years ago as a graduate student because I, we had a uh, research cruise out of here to San Diego. It was a Jim Childress cruise. And we had our usual tiny allotment of money, which meant we were going to have to stay in some dive way off the, the main drag. And so geniuses that we were, we figured, well, if we all pool our money, we could get a room at the Royal Hawaiian. And it would only require smuggling eight people into one room. And we clearly um, lacked the expertise for a crime um, because I, there were several aspects of this that we clearly didn't think through. So um, actually, my husband was part of the team on that, that cruise. This was before we found out that he gets seasick if there's a heavy dew on the lawn. Um, <laughs> but he, he was coming along. And so since we were married, they figured, well, we were the logical pair to, to take the room. And then we'd smuggle everybody else in afterwards. But the part we hadn't figured on was we all had gear for a three-week cruise. We had duffel bags. We had all of this stuff. And so Dave and I were supposed to show up like this was our normal kit. And, <laughs> and we were doing OK. You know, they, everything got loaded onto one of those carts. And they brought it up to the room. Only we hadn't calculated on the tip. And they basically were holding our gear for ransom. They wouldn't let it go until we gave them a tip. And we didn't have that kind of money. So we had to go round up the other six who were hanging around the hotel trying to look like they belonged, <laughs> you know, taking up a collection. And then we still had to negotiate because we didn't have enough. And we had to take the gear off the, the cart. So anyways, it's been a totally different experience this time, I'm <laughs> very glad to say. So. Uh, the title of my talk, Let There Be Light, Exploring and Mapping the Ocean with Bioluminescence. Um, actually, the original version of this was Fiat Lux, the let, Latin for Let There Be Light. And that was homage to my major professor, Jim Case, who used to always sign his um, missives with Fiat Lux. Uh, Jim passed away a few months ago. Um, but I didn't want to admit uh, how old I am that I actually had to take Latin um, in high school, and I expect there's a lot of people here that, that haven't been exposed to Latin, so I decided to go with the, the more routine. Um, so when I took that cruise um, with Jim Childress, I had been doing my PhD and I was you know, working on bioluminescence, but I had no intention of making a career of it. Um, I was actually studying membrane biophysics and I had a postdoc lined up in Madison, Wisconsin with one of the leading membrane biophysicists. And um, it was all looking great. Um, and then I got an opportunity to dive in this strange looking contraption. And we have a couple of other WASP pilots in the audience, Alice Aldrich and uh, Larry Maiden. Alice preceded me um, as a, a WASP pilot. And uh, it changed the course of my career. Diving in WASP completely changed my understanding of the nature of life in the ocean. Also changed my understanding of the expression, colder than a witch's tit. <laughs> it's a metal suit. You'll note the, the wool sweater and the gloves and the wool cap, which I, I think it's Jerry Seinfeld that said, you know, you can, um, you lose 80% of your body heat through your head, which makes it sound like you could, um, if you just had the right hat, you could ski naked. And a hat, hat helps, but it was, it was definitely not quite enough. So WASP was a glorious experience for me, but there was a discomfort factor, which uh, I, I wouldn't want to inflict on anyone else. But I would want to encourage all of you, if you've never been down in a submersible, to take the opportunity. I am telling you, an ROV cannot replace the experience. We have no cameras. And oh, thank you. OK. So uh, just to share a little bit of what it would be like, I mean, this is an awesome experience. And you can now go down in a plexiglass sphere and be incredibly comfortable. 
um, and be able to see for yourself what this amazing light show is like and to be able to be the center of this phenomenal fireworks display that's just going off around you everywhere you look. It's, it's absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And the intensified camera I was using here doesn't even begin to capture what it's like to the human eye. Um, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. And these are amazing, amazing creatures. The things that light up like lightsabers or glowing salamis, depending on your perspective. Um, pyrotechnic parasols and these incredible Catherine wheels of light, these spirals of light um, that, that these animals can create. It's just, it's beyond description. And as I said, you have to see it to believe it. So it's also useful. And uh, over the years, I've developed a library of identified bioluminescent displays and been using this as a mapping tool. And uh, developed a, a technique that we called the Spatial Plankton Analysis Technique, which had the appropriate ac acronym SPLAT, um, which allows you to get um, three-dimensional distribution patterns of um, animals on a fine scale um, structure in the ocean and discover that, in fact, you know, this is not a bulu bays, but as we all know, it, there's a lot of structure in the ocean, and these animals hang out in gangs um, and in um, uh, slums, <laughs> um, and, and uh, there's just incredible things you can find out about how they're distributed, but also it's very interesting because it's a bioluminescent minefield, and so there's very, very low background levels of bioluminescence, but there's very high potential bioluminescence, so if you're down there moving around, you risk exposing yourself every time you move because of the bioluminescence that explodes around you. Um, now, another example of using bioluminescence seems appropriate given what Victor was just talking about, the um, incredible blue water sailors that were the ancient Polynesians to cover these insane distances without the benefit of GPS. And they used a variety of techniques to be able to, to cover these enormous distances. Um, they followed the stars, the sun, the prevailing winds, and the swell. Um, they knew the patterns of migratory birds, so they knew, for example, that long-tailed cuckoos migrated from Tahiti to New Zealand in September, and golden plovers from Tahiti to Hawaii, um, and so they would follow the migratory patterns. Uh, they found ways to look at the, um, a wider footprint based on clouds and wave patterns near islands, they even did things like they trained dogs that they called moi moi to, to bark when they smelled land. Um, and they had one other technique that intrigues me, which was called telapa. And telapa was deep bioluminescence, and it's described in this book, We the Navigators, uh, as underwater lightning, as phenomenal descriptions of this phenomenon that allowed them to see islands as much as 100 miles away. And it's probably bioluminescent plankton being stimulated somehow by backwash and, and internal waves, but nobody's ever figured this out exactly. I actually had a journalist contact me a, f a little while ago, um, and she had made contact with some Micronesians that still claim to be able to map and navigate with Telapa. And she wanted to know if I wanted to go with her because she'd managed to develop a, a relationship with these Micronesian sailors. The only problem was I was going to have to be on a canoe for weeks at a time, and we'd be gone for two months. And I said, regrettably, I couldn't really do that right now. And I think I must have made the right choice because I've never heard from her since. <laughs> um, Another mapping technique for bioluminescence is one that I've been using in my own backyard, the Indian River Lagoon along the east coast of Florida. This was once called the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States. Sadly, that is no longer the case. Um, some of you may even know about this because it's <coughs> actually risen to the level of uh, articles in the New York Times. Um, we've got all kinds of problems along the Indian River Lagoon. At the southern end, we've got discharges thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, carving up the state, and we've got drainage out of Lake Okeechobee, and we've got um, uh, that drainage is causing very low salinity. It's killed off all the oysters. We're having harmful algal blooms. That's a dolphin at the top of the screen covered with a flesh-eating fungal infection. 
Um, in the middle part of the Indian River Lagoon, we've also got discharges. Um, we've got fish kills. We've got turtles showing up with tumors. 60% uh, of the, the uh, green turtles are showing up with these papillomavirus tumors. Um, and in the northern part, we've lost 46,000 acres of seagrass, which is like losing a rainforest. It's incredible. And we're having mass mortalities of dolphins and manatees and pelicans. It's just horrific. Um, so uh, the organization that I started um, some years ago has been focusing on technological solutions to ocean conservation challenges. And um, we originally started out with this little guy called Kilroy, which is a water quality monitoring device. Uh, it's real time, wireless, low cost, easy to install. We have an array of them now in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, it's solar powered and uses telemetry that's basically cell phone technology. We measure a whole range of things, one of which is bioluminescence. Um, so we have a sensor s a system that we can plug into the Kilroy um, that can actually distinguish different types of organisms. For example, two that we're concerned about in the Indian River Lagoon are the comb jelly nemeopsis, which has profound effects on uh, the fisheries when it causes a bloom, or um, the toxic dinoflagellate pyridinium bahamense, um, and we can distinguish them by the types of flashes that they produce. Um, what, the funding that I originally got for developing the Kilroys for, was from a foundation known as Clinil. And at one point, I was giving a presentation to the Clinil Foundation to their board. And one of their board members asked me, but how do you know where to put the Kilroys? And I said something that sounded semi-intelligent at the time, I hope. But you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, that's a really good question. And so when I thought about pollution, when you're talking about water pollution, an awful lot of water pollution ends up residing in the sediment. And so if you can look for pollution sinks, you can have a much better idea of tracking pollutions to its source if you can find out the pollution sinks. And so the way you do that is you take a sediment sample. That's easy enough. But then what do you do with it? You send it off to a lab and wait months and spend thousands of dollars if you don't know what you're looking for. So. Uh, we figured what we needed was the equivalent of a canary in the coal mine. Canaries were used as sensors for the toxic gases that coal miners had to worry about. And so those canaries are the equivalent of a broad-spectrum bioassay. So the broad-spectrum bioassay that we've been using to map pollution in the Indian River Lagoon is bioluminescence. And we're using bacterial bioluminescence. It's an assay we didn't develop. It's been known for years, the microtox um, bioassay. It's been used in the food industry. Um, but what we did was standardize it for sediment samples. So we go out, we take a sediment sample, we bring it back to the lab, mix a little bit of the bioluminescent bacteria with it. And the cool thing with bioluminescent bacteria is they glow all the time because their light output is linked to their respiratory chain. So any toxicant that interferes with respiration interferes with the light output. And you've got a quick, fast, relatively inexpensive way to be, a be able to figure out where your pollution is. And so we can create maps like this one and um, figure out where the hot spots are. So just like on a weather map, red is hot, blue is cold, red is toxic, blue is non-toxic. Well, there's virtually no non-toxic. But the red that you see there is part of uh, where we're getting the outflows from Lake Okeechobee. And actually, uh, we found very high levels of methyl mercury um, in the sediment there. And uh, that has something to do with uh, the, the dolphins with the um, flesh-eating fungal infection. Uh, one of the other cool things about this technique is it's simple enough that we've been able to get the community involved in developing these pollution maps. And so we've been working with students teaching them how to t collect the sediment samples, um, process them in the lab. And they've been, they went out for um, a whole semester where they were going out on these boats to do both water quality and sediment sampling analysis, um, and then reporting their results to the community. And these maps have actually been proving very useful in trying to figure out some of these uh, problems that we're having. Um, so, Bioluminescence is very useful for mapping. Um, it's also very useful for exploring. And uh, I recently um, got to prove that with this expedition, which was in Japan last year, um, which was a very interesting endeavor uh, funded by the Discovery Channel and NHK. I was one of three scientists on the expedition. The others were Dr. Sunimi Kubadera and Steve O'Shea. Um, I'm the short one. and. Uh, it was, um, it was a very interesting adventure. Um, 
I recently heard um, Carl Hyacin, my favorite uh, Florida author who captures the insanity of Florida very effectively, <laughs> describe the experience of selling his first book to Hollywood as being like dropping your kids off at the Charles Manson day daycare center. And you know, putting your science in the hands of television has much the same feel. Uh, case in point is the title of the documentary that came out of this expedition. The original title that they came up with was Giant Squid, The Monster is Real. Well, the scientists were outraged because, first of all, they said, of course it's real. We've known that since the 1700s when specimens were starting to be brought back to labs, and we don't think of it as a monster. So Discovery's Channel version of a compromise was to rename it from Giant Squid, The Monster is Real to Monster Squid, The Giant is Real. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> they actually thought this was a compromise because they said monster could refer to its size instead of its morals. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Sunimi Kubadera had a lot to do with why we were there. Um, he has been searching for the giant squid for a very long time. And in 2004, he succeeded in getting the first still images of a giant squid attacking bait on a line down at 900 meters. And it was based on this that the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, NHK, was willing to foot the bill for this very expensive endeavor to go in search of the giant squid. Now, the way I came to be involved with it was actually through TED and Mission Blue, which got mentioned in our last session today. Um, <coughs> Sylvia Earle's, uh, part of Sylvia Earle's TED Wish, uh, resulted in Mission Blue, um, where several of us, John Delaney was um, one, um, were invited out on this, exp this expedition to the Galapagos, um, and we gave talks. Um, and um, Mike Degree was another uh, member of our group, and Mike's been hunting for the giant squid for a good part of his life. And when I was out there, I was talking about a new way of exploring the deep sea, one that focused on attracting animals instead of scaring them away. And Mike, as always, got very excited, as Mike did about most things, um, and uh, wanted to know if we could apply those techniques to the hunt for the giant squid, because he was already part of this big plan. And um, so it was Mike that got me invited to the Squid Summit, as they called it, um, which was held at the Discovery Channel in August 2010. Yes, it was during Shark Week, and yes, <laughs> there is a shark coming out of that building. There's a tail coming out of the other end of it. And I couldn't help thinking how much it must cost for them to put that up every, every Shark Week and how much funding we could get for, for research. Um, but I tried not to think about that. Anyway. I gave a talk about unobstru unobtrusive viewing and optical luring of deep sea squid. And I talked about the fact that I feel like, you know, a lot of what we're doing is scaring animals away. So I've spent a lot of my career working with these three platforms, the Johnson Sea Link, and then because I'm an adjunct at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and they are incredibly generous, I have gotten quite a bit of time on the Tiburon and the Vantana. And I had this subjective feel that I saw more animals working from the JSL than I did from the Tiburon, and that I saw more animals from the Tiburon than from the Ventana. Um, and so uh, to test that suspicion that it might have something to do with how obtrusive these, uh, these um, platforms were, um, Erica Montague, who's in the audience, and I, she was my graduate student at the time, um, set up to test how noisy they were, and I'm not sure how well you're going to hear this, but this is the audio. Is, are we playing audio? Okay. Um, anyways, uh, the audio from the JSL, it, you can just barely hear it, if, if you hear it at all, there's too much background noise, but it's electric thrust thrusters, and it's very, very quiet. Yeah, I can just barely hear it there. Now, Tiburon is also electric. Um, it has hydraulic capabilities, but it's also electric, um, and you can hear that it's a bit noisier. But you can hear that, right? But most ROVs these days are hydraulic. Um, and that's, in fact, pretty much the standard. And this is what a hydraulic ROV stand sounds like. Ah! 
I think that's got to be scaring a few things away. Uh, I also felt like, you know, if, so what I wanted to do was put a camera on the bottom of the ocean. Lots of people had done that. But I wanted to use red light that was invisible to the animals. And that's a little tricky because red lights absorb so quickly. Um, but thanks to the support from um, Ambari, I was able to test this. Now, this was a proposal I put into the National Science Foundation. And as we all know, NSF will not give you the money unless you can tell them what you're going to discover. I had no idea what I was going to discover. That was the point. Um, so I couldn't get funding for it. So I actually got this started with funding from uh, a little bit of funding that we gave to the Harvey Mudd Engineering Clinic. And we had undergraduate students putting together the pieces of this. They got kind of a bench top system that was sort of working. Then Noah paid for the frame and um, putting it in an underwater housing. And Ambari paid for the battery and some of the early tests. And uh, you know, we tested uh, different lights and figured out what colors would work where we could see the animals, but they couldn't see us. Um, and then I didn't want to just use bait um, because that just brings in scavengers. I wanted to bring in active predators, so I had this idea for using an optical lure that was based on this deep sea jellyfish um, that uses a type of bioluminescence that is a bioluminescent burglar alarm. And the idea behind a burglar alarm is the jellyfish is along minding its own business and a fish comes along and munches on it. It has no hope for escape um, on its own accord, but if it makes a bright enough light show, maybe it can attract something bigger that will attack its attacker and therefore um, afford it an opportunity for escape, which is why it's called a bioluminescent burglar alarm. Um, so uh, we created this optical lure, um, and you can uh, get some sense of just what a, 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 string, a shoestring budget we were on, because you can still see the word Ziploc um, in <laughs> the mold that we used for this. It was, it was very grim for a while, because it was such a kludge job. Um, but um, Erica and I uh, worked with a, an engineer named Lee Fry. Um, who managed to take all these uh, odd bits and pieces and, and start making them all work together. And actually, we uh, were out on an Ambari cruise when it all, all finally came together and actually worked. And there happened to be a photographer on board who caught that precise moment. Um, so that's Erica on the right, myself on the left, and then Lee Fry in the middle. And we have this uh, photograph in our lab in a place of honor um, with the subtitle, Engineer Satisfying Two Women at Once. <laughs> um, so uh, we ran a bunch of different tests. Um, with uh, the e-jelly, and we found that it was, in fact, very attractive to squid. And this was one of the things that I showed um, at the uh, squid summit. Um, so that was a Humboldt squid attacking the e-jelly in Monterey Canyon. Um, this is another one. This is a, a slightly smarter Humboldt squid who recognizes the fact that there should be something chewing on that e-jelly, which is what he's looking for. And so he's, he comes in a little more tentatively uh, and realizes, no, wait a minute, there's supposed to be something else there. And he's very persistent. And then he goes away and he thinks about it for a while, and he thinks, well, maybe if I come in from a different direction? <laughs> no luck. So we... Um, I had this system uh, working very well, actually, um, in a number of different forms. And the, the form that I was proposing for the giant squid expedition was this, which is a camera sled. Um, it's a lander system that can just be thrown off the back of a ship. In fact, it can be deployed from something as small as a rib, um, so long as it's got a davit. Um, and it, uh, it has the e-jelly on it. And so, um, Despite the fact that I had certain trepidations about going along on this expedition, it was six weeks at sea where I was going to be allowed to throw this thing off the back of the ship. And I wasn't at all sure we were going to see giant squid, but I thought, well, we might see some, some interesting stuff nonetheless. Um, so um, I agreed to go. Uh, now, this was an interesting part of it because this is the Aleutia, 
um, which is the ship that it was operated on. This, this is a, a luxury yacht owned by Ray Dalio, um, who uh, is the founder and CIO of Bridgewater Associates. Um, and uh, he has this amazing vessel, which NHK leased. Um, and now that you guys have seen Falcor, you won't be quite as impressed with this, perhaps. Um, but for me, it was unheard of. That's me on the back couch there, working hard, as you can see. Um, this is the most luxurious cruise I've ever been on. This was our, our lab space, which was the dining room. This was our conference space, which is the living room. Notice the white carpets on the floor, um, and it was just crazy, which meant we had these signs everywhere, absolutely no shoes beyond this point. So there were baskets by every door, and then the subs would be being recovered, and you'd run out to recover the sub, and you couldn't remember which door you'd left your shoes by or which basket they were in. So you had this weird situation with people with hard hats running around in bare feet um, <laughs> trying to recover the submersibles. Um, sleeping space was incredible. Office space, incredible. Eating was incredible. Um, and then they, uh, we had um, barbecues up on the um, sun deck. And then when Ray finally came, they cranked it up another notch, notice the white gloves, um, and we had these amazing dinners. Uh, this, this was totally not my seagoing experience or that of most people in this room, I'm quite sure. Um, and then the operations were, were fascinating. They were, he had, Ray has four submersibles. He had three of them on the ship. One was a three-person Triton, the other a uh, two-person um, deep rover. Um, those were the two that we were using. There was also a two-person deep worker um, that we weren't using. All of these are on tracks that could be rolled out of the high bay area. Uh, and so we would launch the Triton and um, go down looking for the giant squid with the Triton using red lights um, and being as, as quiet as possible. The deep rover would stay on deck, but they would deploy um, long-line fishermen. Fishermen had, would go out with 10... Uh, long line fish lines um, that they would deploy around in a horseshoe around the ship. And if one of the boys went down, it was an indication there was something big on the line, so they'd call the ship, we'd deploy the deep rover. But because we were operating in depths over the crush depth of both submersibles, we had to use them tethered. So both subs were on tethers the whole time we were there. I've never done this with, I, I mean, I used a tether with, deep, uh, with WASP, but the other subs I've used are untethered. Um, and so the theory was that you had this long line fishing line, and they had a hook coming out from the deep rover, and so they would hook on to the, the line and then slide down the line 900 meters to whatever they were um, was dugging, tugging on the line so that maybe they could get a picture that way. And so in discussing this whole plan, the word cluster came up a lot um, from, from the more experienced marine operations people. Uh, and I had serious doubts whether I was even going to get into these subs given what was being discussed. This is the deep rover. And the other thing is, this is a ship of opportunity in, in many ways. Um, it's not a dedicated launch and recovery system, which I have a, a lot of issues about because you've just basically got this huge pendulum on the end of a string. Um, but one thing I didn't account for was um, the Aleutia has the most amazing buoyancy control system. So even in pretty high sea states, we weren't really bouncing around that much. So this worked surprisingly well. The other thing that made it all, oh, and this was the Medusa, which then between submersible deployments, um, we could drop off the ship. Um, this was a very, very complicated operation, and the Japanese had actually put a whole lot of thought into this because, you know, half the crew out there were Japanese, um, and we had a real language barrier on top of the other usual things, and so you notice they've got these, these little symbols for everything, and we had um, uh, little cutouts of the, the different things we were using so we could point to them and act out um, what needed to be done. Uh, and you know, each day, every 
moment was planned out, and then we'd have these um, pre-dive meetings that were absolutely excruciating, because first you'd have to say them in English, then they'd have to be translated into Japanese, um, and then there'd be discussion back and forth. Um, and through it all, the person that held it all together was this guy, Mark Taylor. He was the head of marine operations. He's the reason this whole thing worked. Um, he is probably one of the best marine ops people I've ever worked with. Also, in the face of this insanity, it's very important to have a very good sense of humor, which Mark has and demonstrated on several occasions in ways that did not end up in the final documentary. But I thought I would share with you one such occasion when um, Mark was one of the, the swimmers on um, the subs, and I don't know how he talked Tim Catterson into this, but he and Tim were the swimmers, and then I don't know how they talked the stewards into lending them their bikinis, um, but here they are. <laughs> Notice the attention to detail that uh, so-called tattoo on Mark's cheek um, it was, I, I don't know who put that there for him, but... <laughs> raised all kinds of issues in and of itself. And um, he, he definitely acted out the part, but they got the job done. Um, so anyways, as I said, it was a very un unusual cruise from any, <laughs> anyway, but the other thing was, was that it was successful. Um, this was in the, uh, off the Ogasawara Islands, which are um, about a thousand kilometers south of Tokyo. Um, and uh, the reason we went there was that uh, this is where Kubadera had gotten his original shots of the giant squid. Um, but he and NHK had been collecting this data for uh, several years. So they had every single indication of a giant squid, either as um, a tentacle that was caught on a long line or a dead body that had surfaced or a, a sighting of a squid in the sperm whale mouth. Um, and so we, we knew the hot spots where we wanted to dive. And so we would dive the subs there and we would also deploy the, um, the Medusa. And so this is the Medusa with the uh, e-jelly that we developed for this particular expedition um, that had um, lights on both sides of it. Uh, and then we used these red light illuminators. Um, so we were using light that was virtually invisible, we hoped, to the giant squid. Um, and so we could just drop this off the back of the ship, and um, in midwater mode, uh, we just had 700 meters of line on it. Um, and so it was there was a float with a satellite beacon on it at the surface, and we drop it over the side and just let it float around for two to three days at a time. Um, and all the time it was down there. Uh, every other minute, it would produce this burglar alarm display that imitated the display that I told you about of the, the common deep sea jellyfish atolla, this Catherine wheel of light that um, I find so breathtaking. And, uh, and I hope that the, the squid would as well. And so um, it was very funny because uh, when we first got there, they interviewed each of the scientists and asked us about what we thought the odds were that we were really going to find a giant squid. And I think most of us were fairly negative, but the one that just scared them the most was Kubadera, who said he thought maybe there was a 10% chance. And I thought these Japanese cameramen were going to commit seppuku on the spot. I mean, they, their whole lives were hanging in the balance. Um, so when we got our first sighting of a giant squid, which was with uh, my camera system, the Medusa, um, there was wild excitement. And because it was a filmed expedition, they were filming all the time, so we actually got to capture the moment. Um, so that was um, m my assistant. Uh, and this is the first view ever of a live giant oh squid. Oh, my God! Just hanging. Yeah, I, I still get an adrenaline rush when I see that. And so the first few sightings, which were over a period of days, it was like the squid was kind of doing this fan dance. It would just kind of wave its arms in front of the camera, and we wouldn't quite get to see the whole thing. We'd just get these kind of teaser views of it. And I think it was on the, the fifth deployment that we saw this. Look at that. 
I totally love that shot, because notice that it's coming in up over the e-jelly. It's not trying to attack the e-jelly, it's trying to attack the enormous thing next to it, which is presumably the predator that's chewing on the e-jelly. Um, so that was very exciting, and I, uh, the Japanese got a whole lot happier after that occurred. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the coup de grace was this. Um, Kubadera had been going down in the um, submersible, and like me, he was using the red light, but he was also using bait. But after my success with the Medusa, he started attaching a light to the bait. I didn't even realize this until later. <clears throat> but there's a, um, a squid jig attached to this diamondback squid um, flashing. <clears throat> and so this is all you would see, because it was under red light with these EMCCD cameras. Um, and in a second, you're going to see the giant squid come in under red light, which was all Kubadera could see. He couldn't even see it with his own eyes. He could see it on the camera. But he got so excited that he turned on his flashlight to get a better look at it. And when the giant squid didn't seem to run away, he decided to risk turning on the submersible lights. And it worked, because the squid was already chewing on the bait. And so we got these unbelievable images of a giant squid feeding, and it went on for more than 20 minutes. It was incredible. And we were, we were talking to him down in the sub, and they were saying, yes, we're watching a giant squid, and we're saying, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but it, he really, really was. Um, this was the, absolutely the culmination of his career. And this is just amazing footage. This doesn't even begin to do it credit. I mean, you, you can actually see the nose of the squid. That's the olfactory gland in there um, under the groove. And, uh, it's just, and it was so unexpected in how it appeared. Gold and silver. Uh, you know, most of us were expecting that normal deep sea red color. Um, but we watched it change from gold to silver before our eyes. It was just in incredible, absolutely breathtaking. Um, and stuck with him for about 20 minutes, and then uh, um, at the when it kind of reached the end of its the the sub's tether, um, it it departed. So those are just a few applications of bioluminescence, um, and why I think everything goes better with bioluminescence. So Fiat Lux, thank you. Yeah.